Before we talk about the play, I just want to um, go over briefly what we're going to be doing over the next two weeks. All right, so for next time, we're going to be working in class on the group presentation. Right? So any materials you have already assembled for your presentation, bring them with you. Get into your groups. Right? I'll be here to answer any questions you have or to help you out with anything you need. Um, I will also send some of you, a few of you have actually asked me for suggestions on you know, things you might look up, uh, books you might look for uh, in doing your research for the project. Um, those of you who haven't, I'll still send you a couple of suggestions. Um, things that you should be able to, relative, to find relatively easily. If not in our library, then somewhere in the library system. So it should get there by the time you have to do the presentation. Um, on the 29th, we're going to be doing peer review in class of paper three. So what you're going to want to do is bring with you your current draft of paper three, bring two copies of it, and we'll break up into uh, probably groups of three. Right. So same process as peer review for paper one. Now sometime between today and December 1st, I would also like you to make an appointment to meet with Megan in the Writing Center about your paper. If you've already done that, great. If you haven't, uh, get on that. I also want you to come and meet with me on either the 30th or the 1st. Right, so on the 30th, I'm going to be available most of the day. Right? I'll be in the office from 9 to 12, and then again from 2 to 5. I have a two-hour review session with my cultural theory class at 12, but otherwise I will be in, I will be in the office all day. Um, and please come anyway because I'm probably going to be really freaking bored. Um, so I will be there all day on the 1st. So I do want each of you to come and meet with me with whatever current version of your draft you have um, and with your annotated bibliographies. Now if you've never done an annotated bibliography before, I will bring an example to class with me um, on Monday that you can work from. Right, so essentially what you do with an annotated bibliography, it's a works cited page, but you have a little abstract of each source after its entry, right? So like a, a little short, you know, a short paragraph telling me a little bit about the source, right? Like just a little brief summary of it. Okay. On the 6th, we're going to have our group presentations, and paper three will be due at midnight. I am also going to give you the opportunity to revise either paper one or paper two for a better grade. Right, so if you get me something, you get me a revision by the 9th of either paper one or paper two, you can increase your score on that paper by up to one full letter grade, right? So if you got a C on it initially, you do some revisions, you can get a B, right? If you got a B, you can get an A. I don't guarantee a full letter grade's advancement. It's going to depend on how good your revisions are. But, yeah, if you, do, you can do the revisions and you can get yourself a better grade on paper one or paper two. That'll be due on the ninth. Um, and again, if you have questions about what specifically you would need to do, what specifically you could do to better revise, um, then just uh, come talk to me. So, I mean, you can, you can still earn more points, right? So, um, particularly on a first go, I, never give, I almost never give anyone a perfect score. So yeah, I mean, if you want to do, if, if you have an A or an A minus and you still want to do, you still want to try to get a, get a better, get more points, yeah, you can still do the revisions. Um, but yeah, by and large, this is to help those of you who have been, you know, getting D's, C's, or B's on the paper, right, to advance that grade a little bit. Um, okay, so does anybody have any questions at all about any of this, about anything that we're doing? Right, today is the last time we're going to be actually reading any specific text for class. Okay? All right, great. Then let's talk about Tom Stoppard. How'd this go for you? What'd you think? It's good? You liked it? It was better than the other one. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is a little confusing. Okay, what, what made it easier to read? Okay. The last one, you would read it, and you would have to read it a couple times to actually understand what they're talking about. Yeah, and I think some of the issue with um, 
Mother Courage is, the, it's translated from German, and the guy who did the translation was trying to put Brecht's German into a kind of like working class British dialect. So that probably threw some of you off a little bit. But yeah, Stoppard is writing, yeah, Stoppard is also British. He's actually, um, he's actually Czech, uh, Czech Jewish, but Czech Jewish living and raised in Britain. Um, and uh, yeah, he doesn't use, he, do, he doesn't use the same sort of twisted dialects. Um, Okay, so what, what else, what, why did you, what else made you like this one better than the other one? I'm just curious. Pardon? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this is a hell of a lot funnier than Mother Courage, right? It is, you know, it, it's a comedy of a bleak sort. It's also a little bit more familiar to us, right? Plot notwithstanding. Is this a play that would make any sense or could have any existence without the existence of another play? Yeah, if not for Hamlet, this would be complete nonsense, right? There's plenty of nonsense in it as it is, but it owes its very existence to Shakespeare's play. How is this play related to Hamlet? Yeah, all the almost all the characters, really all of the characters are taken from Hamlet, right? So yeah, it shares a cast. And how does the material from Hamlet, apart from the shared characters, get worked into this? What does Stopper do with the part with the material from Hamlet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he shifted the point of view right from the important characters in Hamlet to these two nobodies who only appear in a couple of scenes and are really only used as a kind of plot device to get Hamlet to England. So within the world of Hamlet, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are insignificant characters. So what Stoppard has done, yeah, is taken and taken the taken Hamlet and recentered around these two guys. Now, do we see anything that comes directly from Hamlet? Any lines, any scenes that come directly from Hamlet? The lines. Yeah. There are a lot of speeches and whatnot, like when that are verbatim copied, right? Just verbatim copied out of Shakespeare. Whenever anyone who's not Rosencrantz and Guildenstern or the player comes in, they just speak Shakespeare's lines and then go off. So <clears throat> what we have here in Stopper, we have an example of what's called postmodern drama. One of the key features of postmodernism as, uh, as a literary style is what we call intertextuality. So a postmodern text usually relies on some other text to give it meaning, right? Or it means more in connection with other texts that it references. Now related to this is the idea of metadrama, right? In a lot of ways, this is a play about what it means to write or to perform in a play, right? So a metadrama is a play that is about plays, a play that is about theater. 
So in a metadrama, you'll often get characters doing things like breaking the fourth wall. Everybody knows what this means, right? Yeah. That's right, so a character in a movie, a show, or a play starts talking directly to the audience, sort of steps out of the world of the play. You'll get a lot of references to theatrical devices in a metadrama. Now the other, th the other big thing about postmodernism, what most postmodern art tends to do, in addition to making these kind of intertextual collages and being very kind of self-referential, it usually questions what historians, literary critics, and philosophers call grand narratives. Grand narratives are sort of like myths, right? They're these big ideas that most members of a culture share that um, sort of bind that culture together in some way, right? So if we think about uh, specifically American myths, right? Um, have you ever heard of the phrase manifest destiny? Okay, yeah, what was manifest destiny? What does that mean? Uh huh. And not only that it was something that Americans should do, right? White Americans from the East specifically, but was something that they were destined to do, right? It was something that we were going to do no matter what, right? We were just going to move westward and fill in all of that empty territory, right? The problem, of course, being that that territory wasn't really empty. And <clears throat> those going out there then had to figure out what to do with the people who already lived there. But that's so. Manifest destiny is one of these grand narratives, right? And what I've just given you in sort of taking the idea of manifest destiny apart is an example of what a postmodern historian would do to a grand narrative, right? You look at the grand narrative and you break it apart into these sort of tinier components. And the truth for a postmodernist is really in those tinier components rather than the grand narratives, right? The little narratives that get combined or even erased when talking about grand narratives um, are what's important to a postmodernist, right? So there are some big ideas at work in this play. And I think it would probably help us to figure out what those are if we sort of just look at it closely for a moment. If we just go to page 11, beginning of Act 1. Can I get a Rosencrantz and a Guildenstern? All right, Rosencrantz. Guildenstern. All right, so we have two Elizabethans passing the time in a place without any visible character. They are well-dressed, hats, cloaks, sticks, and all. Each of them has a large leather money bag. Guildenstern's bag is nearly empty. Rosencrantz's bag is nearly full. The reason being, they are betting on the toss of a coin in the following manner. Guildenstern, hereafter Gil, takes a coin out of his bag, spins it, letting it fall. Rosencrantz, hereafter Rose, studies it, announces it as heads, as it happens, and puts it into his own bag. Then they repeat the process. They have apparently been doing this for some time. The run of heads is impossible, yet Rosencrantz betrays no surprise at all. He feels none. However, he is nice enough to feel a little embarrassed at taking so much money off his friend. Let that be his character note. Guildenstern is well alive to the oddity of it. He is not worried about the money, but he is worried by the implications. Aware, but not going to panic about it. His character note. Guildenstern sits. Rosencrantz stands. He does the moving, retrieving coins. Guildenstern spins. Rosencrantz studies coin. Yes. He picks it up and puts it in his bag. The process is repeated. Heads. 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 There's an art to the building. There's an art to the building up of suspense. 
sense. Hence, though it can be done by luck alone. Hence, if that's the word I'm after. 76, luck. Guildenstern gets up and has nowhere to go. He spins another coin over his shoulder without looking at it, his attention being directed at his environment or lack of it. Hence, a wicked man might be moved to re-examine his faith, if in nothing else, at least in the law of probability. He slips a coin over his shoulder as he goes to look upstage. Hence, Guildenstern, examining the confines of the stage, flips over two more coins as he does so. One by one, of course. Rosencrantz announces each of them as... Rosencrantz? Oh, God. Game. <laughs> um, the law of probability, it has been oddly asserted, is something to do with the proposition that if six monkeys... Game? If six monkeys were... Are you? Were they? Wait. Oh. I'm on, were they? Yep. Okay. Are were you? <laughs> okay, go ahead. From game. Guildenstern, understanding. Uh, game, the law of averages, if I have got this right, means that if six monkeys were thrown up in the air for long enough, they would have landed on their tails about as often as they would land on their heads, which even at the first glance does not strike one as a particularly rewarding speculation in either sense, even without the monkeys. I mean, you wouldn't bet on it. I mean, I would, but you wouldn't. Heads. Would you? Energizing himself somewhat, he takes out a coin, spins it high, catches it, turns it over onto the back of his other hand, studies the coin, and tosses it to Rosencrantz. His energy deflates and he sits. Well, it was an even chance, if my calculations are correct. Okay, so let's stop there for a second. We'll come back to this. But <clears throat> this little game of coin flipping that they're doing, what's weird about it? always lands on heads every time, right? Now, if we think about how probability works, we tend to think that it'll be about 50-50, right? Because each time you flip the coin, it has an equal chance of landing on heads or tails. Actually, technically, it has a slightly higher chance of landing on tails because the head side is heavier, but that's neither here nor there. So, you know, just next time you're involved in a game of coin flips, remember that. But yeah, so it keeps coming up heads. So actually, according to the law of probability, this is, while unsettling, perfectly reasonable. Because each individual flip has an equal chance of turning up heads or tails. But the fact that it keeps turning up heads Right, this is kind of ominous, in part because what do we know is going to happen to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern simply from the title of the play? Yeah, so it's a foreshadowing of what's going to happen to these two characters. Right, that's why the coin always comes up heads. But it also, again, creates, when we think about probably, you know, this sort of sense of what philosophers call determinism. Does anybody know what determinism means, what this word means? Anybody heard this word before? Okay, determinism is the idea that to some extent, everything that's going to happen to you, everything that's happening to you right now, has already been determined by some sort of outside force, right? Whether it's God, whether it's fate, whether it's whatever, right? You have no real free will, you have no real control over your actions. Everything that you do, everything that you think, everything that happens to you has already been determined by someone or something else, right? So that's determinism. The idea that we usually oppose to this is free will. The idea 
that we have ultimately control over our own actions and our own destinies. So the coin flip game sets up an air of determinism in the play. Now, does Guildenstern seem to be able to accept determinism easily, the idea of determinism? Now, he's got to keep testing it, right? He's got to keep flipping the coin, and he's got to keep asking about it, like thinking about the implications. What does this mean? What about Rosencrantz? Yeah, perfectly okay with what's happening, right? And this is sort of the way these two characters develop through the play. Are they given very individual personalities in Shakespeare? Yeah, they're more or less interchangeable in Hamlet, right? To the point where, like, how do other characters from Hamlet tend to regard them when they meet them? Yeah, they get them mixed up. They get themselves mixed up, right? They often refer to each other incorrectly. So other people seem to regard them as interchangeable. But we do see in these scenes, right, and these, what these scenes are essentially is whatever these characters are doing when they're not on stage in Hamlet. What we see in these scenes is the development of, of individual personalities in each of them, right? Rosencrantz. by and large, passively accepts the world as it is. Well, Guildenstern questions everything he sees, everything that happens. Which of the two of them seems smarter to you? Which of them seems more intelligent? Guildenstern usually, yeah, certainly uses bigger words, right? Is always referencing philosophical concepts and the very idea to us of questioning, right? The idea that you're questioning your reality makes you seem smart. So yeah, Guildenstern comes off as more intelligent. Well, Rosencrantz maybe comes off as a little bit nicer, right? a little bit more compassionate. So let's continue from <clears throat> where we left off, and I'll tell you where to stop. So let's go, uh, Ayana, start with 85 in a row, beating the record on page 14. 85 in a row, beating the record. Don't be absurd. Easily. Is that it, then? Is that all? What? A new record? Is that as far as you are prepared to go? Well... No question, not even a pause. You spun them yourself. Not a flicker of doubt. Well, I won, didn't I? And if you lost, if they'd come down against you 85 times, one after another, just like that. 85 in a row? Tails? Yes, wouldn't you think? Well, well, I'd have a good look at your coins for a start. I'm relieved. At least we can still count on self-interest as predictable factors. I suppose it's the last to go. Your capacity for trust made me wonder, perhaps, you alone, touch. Rosencrantz claps, clasps his hand. Guildenstern pulls him up to him. Oh. We have been spinning coins together since. This is not the first time we have spun coins. Oh, no. We've been spinning coins for as long as I remember. How long is that? I forget. Mind you, 85 times. Yes. It'll take some beating, I imagine. Is that what you imagine? Is that it? No fear? Fear? Fear. The crack that might flood your brain with light. Next. He puts it in his bag. All right, let's stop there again for a second. Now, <clears throat> the idea of memory here is actually really important, right? Why is it important that they've been spinning coins for as long as they can remember? Yeah, that is as far back as they can remember. 
Right? There's the, the bit where they're, you know, they're asking each other, like, do you remember your mother? Like, no, do you? The first thing either of them remembers is the messenger coming to get them to bring them to Elsinore, right? Why is it that they can't remember anything before that? They have no place in the play before that, right? They have no place in Hamlet before the messenger comes and sends for them. So Rosencrantz and Guildenstern aren't, like, are they meant to represent real people in any way? Yeah, they're just characters in a play. And so their existence begins at the moment when the play requires them. They have no prior existence. That's why they don't remember anything further back, right? They don't remember their mothers because they don't have mothers. They don't remember their childhoods because they didn't have childhoods. Their only existence is as characters in a play. That's it. So what about what does, this, what does this do with this sort of idea of determinism and free will, right? What kind of universe is being set up? Are these characters who have any real freedom of action? No. What's happened to them, what's going to happen to them has already been spelled out, and not even by Tom Stoppard, right? What's going to happen to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, right? Top, Stoppard himself is constrained by the fact that these are characters from another play who have already met their fate in that play. So Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have to die because that's the way Hamlet is written. So when Guildenstern is talking on the boat about getting our release, there's no release. We know there's no release coming, right? We know that they're going to be executed. So I want to show you a brief clip. Um, this is from a film version of the play. Um, it messes a little bit with, the, with that final scene. Um, it shortens it and uh, eliminates, rearranges some lines. But the essence of the scene is the same, right? So it's the scene in which um, you know, they're on the ship and Guildenstern kills the player. So one thing that I want you to think about here, right, is how Rosencrantz and Guildenstern each meet their ultimate fate, right? How do they approach the knowledge of their deaths? And I want you to think about what Guildenstern expects to happen when he stabs the player.
What's happening? It's 
to what is expected. Death for all ages and occasions. So why is it that Guildenstern can't kill the player? I'm sorry? It was not already shown. Yeah, that doesn't happen in the play. Guildenstern can't do anything that isn't already determined by the script of Hamlet. So the only things he can do are go to Elsinore, say some stupid things about ambition to Hamlet, and get sent to England on a boat. After which, he just ceases to be in the play. Right, you know, he notes at one point, you know, what is death? You know, death is a man, you know, death is a man who just doesn't show up again. It's just somebody disappearing. And yet, I think we see in some of the lines that these two characters speak in this scene, um, encapsulations both of their worldview and of this big argument in the play about determinism and free will, right? We have this, you know, they're, they're talking about you know, whether or not getting on a boat was a mistake, right? So we have Guildenstern says, where we went wrong was getting on a boat. Rosencrantz says, they had it in for us right from the start. Now, Guildenstern has struck us through most of this as more intelligent, but who's actually got it right? Yeah, Rosencrantz has been right all along. Where we went wrong was getting on a boat suggests that Guildenstern thinks what? Yeah, that if we never got on a boat, this never would have happened. So, what could he have avoided? He could have avoided death by avoiding getting on a boat, right? But he can't avoid getting on a boat because the play is written that way. So he still, even at the very end, when the ropes are around their necks, you know, there must have been a moment when we could have said no but we missed it. 
he still clings to this illusion that at some point he might have had a choice. He clings to this illusion of free will. Now, what about Rosencrantz? Right? They had it in for us. Right? To tell you the truth, I'm relieved. He accepts what's going to happen, right? So, okay, at least it's over. Right? At least we don't have to go through this anymore. Now, what about the very last thing Guildenstern says before the rope drops? If you look on page 126, right? he gathers himself. Well, we'll know better next time. Now you see me, now you and disappears. Why does he say, we'll know better next time? Yeah, exactly. The next time this play is performed, or even the next time Hamlet is performed, right? Same thing's gonna happen over again. Every night, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are gonna die and then they'll be back for the next performance. Right? That's what life is for a character in a play with no independent existence. Right? As long as the play continues to be performed, they continue to exist and to go through the same motions, speak the same speeches every night. So on the one hand, he is acknowledging his status as a character and his knowledge that he's going to be back. But he still doesn't get it, right? He seems to feel that there will be some lesson learned between tonight's death and tomorrow's standing on a road flipping coins with Rosencrantz. He doesn't realize that by tomorrow night, he will have forgotten everything that he learned in the previous performance. So not only do Rosencrantz and Guildenstern not remember their previous lives, their lives previous to being written into Hamlet, they also don't remember the previous performances of their own story. Right? They have no memory of anything apart from the point where they enter the play every night. So <laughs> the universe that Stoppard sets up here, I think we can say is pretty clearly determinist, right? Free will is an illusion that one of the characters has to continually delude himself into believing even as everything that's happening around him tells him that he has no real control over events. Right? From that improbable run of heads right up to his final execution. Does anybody have any questions or comments about any of this? And you're like, I'm... <laughs> you look like you're forming a question for us. Okay, I'll give you a minute. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Anything you want to say about it? Yeah, Matthew. Uh, this is kind of a topic, but it's related to the film. Okay. Um, was it like who was the director of the film? Because I kind of got more of like a Monty Python sort of thing from it. Yeah, the the director. I forget the director's name. I think it's it's somebody from somewhere in Eastern Europe. Okay. Um, but yeah, most of the uh, yeah the act most of the actors are well, Richard Dreyfuss is playing the, the player, Gary Oldman is Rosencrantz and Tim Roth is Guildenstern. So the, apart from Richard Dreyfuss, the cast is mostly British. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. And Stoppard is British. But yeah, I think yeah I, th I think there is uh, Stoppard is actually writing this play around the same time that 
these kind of postmodern comedy groups like Monty Python are becoming really popular, you know, whose whole shtick is um, kind of subverting old-fashioned English music hall comedy. Yeah, they're doing a very similar kind of thing. So I think you're absolutely right to see a similarity to Monty Python here. Mm -hmm. Does Alfred write other plays with this determinist view, or was this simply because of the constrictions of the other plays that he referenced from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's, that's actually a really good question. Um, and I think that, yeah, this is sort of a, a individual in Stoppard's uh, works. He actually does write a lot of these kind of meta theater sorts of plays um, that do set up more surprisingly determinist uh, universes. Like there's a, another play, it used to be published in the Norton intro, it's called uh, The Real Inspector Hound. Um, and it's actually, um, it's shorter than this play. And personally, I think it's actually a lot funnier. Uh, but it's these two theater critics who are sitting, watching a play, like it's a run-of-the-mill, shitty murder mystery play. Um, and, you know, they're, the critics then sort of get caught up into the play um, and lose control of the action. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, it's a theme that appears in some of his plays and not others. Right, and sort of this connection between real life and the stage um, is another kind of issue that he explores kind of a lot. Let's actually quickly go to, um, there's a bit where the, the player is uh, angrily explaining to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern his craft and his purpose, right, after meeting them again at Elsinore after they abandoned him on the road. Look on page 63. Can I get a Rosen? Well, why don't we retain our Rosencrantz and our Guildenstern? And can I get a player? All right, Forrest, be the player. All right, so we'll start with um, Rosencrantz. So you've caught on. Page sixty-three. Yep. So you caught on. So you caught up. Not yet. You left us. I've forgotten. You perform a drastic, spect a dramatic spectacle on the way. Yes, I'm sorry we had to miss it. We can't look each other in the face. You don't understand the humiliation of it. To be tricked out of the single assumption which makes our existence viable, that somebody is watching. The plot was two corpses gone before we caught sight of ourselves, stripped naked in the middle of nowhere, pouring ourselves down a bottomless well. Is that 38? There we were. Demented children mincing about in clothes that no one ever wore, speaking as no man ever spoke, swearing love in wigs and rhymed couplets, killing each other with wooden swords, hollow protestations of faith hurled after empty promises of vengeance, and every gesture, every pose vanishing into thin, unpopulated air. We ransomed our dignity to the clouds, and the uncomprehending birds listened. Don't you see? We're actors. We're the opposite of people. Okay, you, can thank, uh, you can stop there. Thank you very much. Now, what does he mean when he says that actors are the opposite of people? Pardon? Okay, yeah, on the one, yeah, the characters anyway will go on living when people die, right? Yeah, Matthew. Actors have a specific role to play while people choose what they want to be. Okay, that an actor has uh, less independent existence that um, right, the role you play in any given performance is predetermined. Mm -hmm. And what else, like, I think related to this also is this idea that the only thing that gives his life meaning is the idea that somebody is watching. What does this indicate that he doesn't have? If in order for him to exist, somebody has to be watching, what does he not have? Well, he has an audience if somebody is watching, right? But he, essentially what he's saying is like, I can't exist without an audience. No free will, no inner life, right? No independent existence, no private life. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and an actor, as the player puts it, does not have a private life when he's on stage. A character in a play does not have a private life. Everything the character does, does in front of, he does in front of people, or it didn't happen. Think in your head now, think of the most private, secret, intimate thing you have ever done, secure in the knowledge of its privacy. He gives them and the audience a good pause. Rosencrantz takes on a shifty look. Are you thinking of it? He strikes with his voice in his head. Well, I saw you do it. Rosencrantz leaps up, dissembling madly. You never, it's a lie. He catches himself with a giggle in the vacuum and sits down again. So he can say this, he can make this claim. Right? He's essentially said that everybody watching the play right, is also an actor, is also being watched all the time. That no one ever does anything that's truly private. He says, well, I saw you do it. So the world the, of determinism here extends for these players, for these actors, off the stage as well. Right. Any little private thing you think you've done, you know, didn't think anybody saw it? Yeah, we did. We know. And we're going to put it up on stage. That's what actors do. Right. They perform the private lives of others rather than having private lives, private existences themselves. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, yeah. So I remember um, seeing that at one point when they were flipping the coin, mm -hmm. that it did land on tails. But yeah, Gildenstern, yeah, Gildenstern wasn't there to see it. So uh huh. If he did see it, would that kind of give him hope that there is free will? Or? But he can never see it, right? Okay. That's part of the point is that he will never see that coin that was tails. Because the play's not written that way. So he will never have, um, he will never have a means of escape, right? He'll never have an out. Every night, every time, he's gonna think he has one. And every night he's gonna be proven wrong. And still end up hanging from the yard arm, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good question, but yeah, part of the idea of the play is that um, these things that happen to the characters, like, they can't happen any other way. This is just the way it's got to be. Any other questions, comments, concerns, or complaints? I noticed uh, earlier when you mentioned that the, uh, the actors perform and Mm -hmm. Though they know what what to avoid, mm -hmm. and they realize that at that point, and then they realize they say, "Well, at least we'll know next time." Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of like it's like they're stuck in a loop, like and they that they, exactly. they can't escape out of. Yeah, and they just yeah, that's exactly the way the play works. It, it's yeah, it's, it's an infinite loop. That as long as people are reading or performing this play, it's always going to happen exactly the same way, and Gildenstern can't learn. And he can't learn because he's written that way, right? He's written as somebody who can't learn. All right, anything else? All right, I guess uh, we'll let you go then. Uh, make sure to turn in your in-class writings. Um, and we'll see you next Monday to work on the group presentations. Yes, Tuesday.